Good morning, church. Y'all can be seated for just a second. Um, if you don't mean, don't know me, my name is Owen. I'm one of the pastors here at Progression Church. And I just want to say welcome, welcome home, welcome to um, Progression Church, whether this is your first time or you've been here since the beginning. Um, before we continue in worship, I just wanted to read some scripture of encouragement. So we, this is our first Sunday in December, so we are building up, leading up to Christmas, which is the day that we celebrate, um, as Christians around the world celebrate the birth of Jesus. So starting in Luke 2, um, verse 8, this is right after Jesus is born. Verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you this is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will, be, you will find a baby wrapped in swathing clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So that is like one of the reasons why we are here this morning, is to join with that chorus in praising the Lord for the good things that he has done. Ultimately, the greatest thing he has ever done is, is bring us to Christ, who would live this, on this earth, I mean, he would die for our sins, paying the debt that we deserve to pay in exchange, granting us the ability to live with God and enjoy um, sonship and daughtership with him for eternity. So as we continue in worship, I just want to um, encourage y'all to make that like the, the origin of your worship, that joining in with that chorus who is praising God for what he has done and that he has brought in this great joy that we now have, the, the um, great joy we have in spreading the good news of what Jesus has done for us. So I'm going to lead us in a quick prayer and then we're going to continue in worship. Take a like, few moments just to thank God for this season and for what um, he has done for us in Jesus. Take a few moments to ask that your focus will be on praising him for those good things that he has done. God, we just thank you. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for what we have, this joy that we have, that we get to have a relationship with you. And as we enter this season of Christmas, we just ask that that would be um, a, a joy that just overflows in us and um, enables us and empowers us by your spirit to go out and, and share this joy that we have with others. And as we continue in worship, help us to worship you as that great chorus does in Luke 2. In Luke 2 praising you for the great things that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship together. It's our prayer that Christ would be the center. We're going to teach you guys this song this morning.
that in this house, in Progression Church, Christ will be the center. And let it be said of this house that we will love him and obey him.
Amen. You guys can be seated this morning. Progression Church, what's up? How we doing? Good? Yeah. Y'all can make some noise. <laughs> it's all right. To, it's all right to be excited about being at church. Okay. Um, well, uh, hey man, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Joe. I'm at, believe it or not, I'm actually one of the teaching pastors here at the church. Okay. Um, it's been a real. He's laughing really hard because it's been a really long time since I taught. Okay. <laughs> and so for various reasons, I've had to like cancel my preaching dates. I had to call in last minute because I got sick last time a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then R Brian returned the favor. He got in touch with me about 10.30 last night and said, well, I'm sick. You're up. All right. So here we are, and I'm excited to get to preach. Uh, Brian actually is really doing me a favor because I'm pumped. I love to preach to Progression Church. Y'all are such a fun church to preach to. Uh, I'm going to start off the way that we, we normally start off, and I like to ask you guys a question and get you guys thinking a little bit, interacting a little bit. So here's the question that I want us to open up with to start with. It's this. Have you ever wondered if you did or said something and it was okay that you did or said it? Like, have you ever had that moment where you did or said something and you're like, was that okay? Like, should I have done this? So like, here's a few examples for me, okay? If this resonates with you, let your neighbor know about it a little bit. Show, show me your hand, whatever. Um, like, for, for one, of the, one of the regrets that I'm never going to have in my life is mentioning to an individual their pregnancy and find out they're not pregnant, okay? Never going to happen not going to happen in my life. There can be a woman walking into labor and delivery, and I will not bring up her child until she does, okay? It's just a rule that I have, right? But we, maybe some of us have had that mistake where we like brought it up and we were like, oh my gosh, I was totally wrong on that situation. And it's kind of like, was that okay? You learned it wasn't okay, okay? Now, let's get into a little bit more complicated scenarios, all right? <clears throat> so how many of you here you would say, I'm a cut through the parking lot kind of person. When you're driving, you're like, why am I sitting here? I'm going to cut through the parking lot. Right, okay, so we're kind of divided in the church here. Now, apparently this day happened, and I have no clue why I allowed this day to happen. But apparently at some point in my life, I took it upon myself to turn to my kids and go, you know, kids, it's actually illegal to pull through a parking lot and pull onto the road from there. Right? I don't know why I did that, because now, anytime I'm ever like, we've got this one particular light that I'm like, 
this takes forever. I'm never going to leave, okay? This, this light is the length of, of a full feature film, okay? And so, like, I'm sitting there. There's this occasion where I'll kind of pull through. It's kind of like a quasi-parking lot road kind of thing. Um, and then I pull through it, and then my kids will be like, hey, Dad, isn't that against the law? And I'm like, ah, I should have never told you. Knowledge is power, and I gave you too much. Um, and then, of course, this one, is, uh, this one has lasted throughout the ages, okay? Um, the old question of should you bring your own candy into the movie theater, okay? So, like, I recently we went to a movie um, this past week, and uh, we went and watched the Trolls movie. A and for those of you that are interested, it was a terrible movie. All right, anyway, so um, we went to the Trolls movie. Um, my kids loved it. I did it for them. So we went to the Trolls movie, but there was this this thing inside of me that's like, goodness gracious, do I pay $10 for some Sour Patch Kids, or can I just stop at this Walgreens and pay less than half the cost, right? Like, do you guys ever wrestle with that? Like, am I just going to pay $20 for this Coke, okay, whenever I could probably get a bottled one and stick it in my back pocket, and it would probably be fine, okay? Right, so I would imagine a number of you guys, you probably land in different places on this issue, but we can all agree it's a little bit nuanced. It's a little bit gray, right? Like, some of you are like, dude, just take the nerds into the theater. Like, quit overthinking this, right? And then there are others of us who are like, you're the rule follower, and you're like, oh, but they're, they're literally going to frisk me, okay? <laughs> if I get in, they're going to be like, welcome to your movie. Spread them. <laughs> read them. What's this? Huh? What's this? Is it your keys? I bet it's not your keys. It's nerds. All right. So anyways, we all land in different places and scenarios like this, and they're kind of nuanced. They're kind of gray. They're kind of black and white. Like, does the movie theater really want me to bring candy in? Well, the reason I bring this scenario up is this exists in our faith. This is at play in our walk with God. But there are these certain scenarios that a lot, of, a lot of things in our Christian faith are black and white, and they're very clear as we have the scriptures, right? But then there are some instances and scenarios where we would say, hey, it's really not black and white. Like, hey, there's, there's a little bit of nuance to this conversation. Or you know what? On this topic, there are some believers that believe this, and then there are some believers who believe this, and that there's kind of a conflicting consensus, right? Or I guess that really doesn't even make sense, but there's like a conflicting viewpoint on each side. And so it brings up examples like, uh, how do we decide if we should watch that show or not? How do we decide as a Christian who loves Jesus, how do we decide whether or not we should watch that movie? As a follower of Jesus, how do we decide whether or not it, that we really should listen to this song or this music? It brings up questions like, how do I decide whether or not to participate in this particular activity? Some people think it's okay. Some people say that you shouldn't do it. Like, but by participating, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Like, how do I know? How do I know if I should, and this, this is going to be relevant very soon, how do I decide if I should vote for this candidate, right? Like some people believe this, and then some people believe this. Progression Church, we are, we're a purple church. Like we have people on the left and on the right when it comes to politics. And, and, and you probably would say, man, I think it's crazy that you would vote with that other party, okay? But here's the thing. We are believers who love Jesus, and we land in different places. There's nuance, okay? How do I know if I should affirm that behavior? And so in our Christian walk, we have this weird dynamic where there's nuance. There's gray area in our faith, and we wonder how we ought to proceed in some of these gray areas. Now, lucky for us, Paul is going to deal with this issue. Now, it's, it's an issue that we don't really deal with today, but it is an issue that when we unpack, we're going to be able to take the principle that Paul applies, and we're going to be able to apply it to our lives today. Should I do this as a believer? It's not clear. It's not black and white. There's nuance here. But in the gray areas, how do I live for God? What does that look like for me? Okay, so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be going through verses 1 through 13, okay? We're going to move through the first few verses pretty quickly to just set some context up and understand some things. 
And then we're going to really nail down to what Paul's big point is and how we can live that out, okay? So the context is this. You have people who are being saved in Corinth. Um, There are lots of people who are being saved out of idolatry, worship of false gods. And the way that they would worship, in a lot of cases, is they would go to these temples. They would provide an animal sacrifice or a, a meat sacrifice. And what would take place is usually that meat or that animal, it would be sacrificed, it would be burned. The priest would either eat a portion or the person who made the sacrifice would eat a portion. And then another portion of that, a lot of times, ended up with a merchant who would end up selling that meat, right, for other people to enjoy for private consumption. So you live in this culture where people are making sacrifices to false idols, to false gods, in this culture that believes in multiple gods and all kinds of different beliefs, and then they would sell it and people would eat it. Now, here's what you had going on in the church in Corinth. You had a group of believers who were saved out of this idolatrous system, and, they, and they're having trouble shaking some of their old beliefs. And so what, what you have is you have these believers who uh, would see other Christians in the church eating food that was sacrificed to an idol. They would go, they would purchase it, they would eat it, or they would even eat in that place. And what you had was Christians who came out of that system would say, what are you doing? This is wrong. Like, we, we can't eat food that's been sacrificed to idols. And so here, you can kind of see the situation we're in. We've got believers who are resolved, and they're like, no, this, it's just an idol. It's this, this meat means nothing. It's not even sacrificed to a real God. And so they eat this meat, and they enjoy it. But then you've got other believers who in, in our passage is going to be described in a particular type of way. They would say, oh, but we shouldn't be doing this. Like, this is, this is wrong, right? Like, I, I came out of this to worship the one true God. And so what do we do when there's conflicting viewpoints on an issue? And so we're going to dive into the text, and we're going to understand what's going on. Paul's going to begin to unpack this issue, and he's going to help the, the Corinthians understand how to handle it, okay? So listen to what Paul says in verse 1. Now, about food sacrificed to idols... We know that we all have knowledge. Now, Paul is probably quoting um, another one of these mantras or these sayings that was probably written in a letter to him earlier from the Corinthians. We all have knowledge. In other words, there are things that we are certain of in our faith. There are things that we're resolved in that we know that we believe. And then look at what he says here. This is one of the first things that I want us to understand. He says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. So what Paul is saying is, before we even begin this conversation, it's important for us to talk about the relationship between knowledge and love. And so what Paul is teaching them is he's saying, listen, knowledge If it's void of love, puffs up, and it leads to arrogance. We dealt with this at the beginning of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. That they were almost arrogant in the things that they believed and that they understood. They weren't even necessarily wrong, but it led to arrogance. But then Paul says, love builds up. And so what Paul is saying is, love is greater than knowledge. Not that knowledge is bad, understanding what we believe and believing the right things are good. But what he's saying is, if you have knowledge and no love, that's destructive. However, if you have love that comes from God, that will give you knowledge and that will build up. And so this is what Paul is saying. So why is he saying this? Love or knowledge without love leads to arrogance, but love builds other people up. You've all heard people who have said what is right, but they've said it in the wrong way, right? Have you ever been a victim of somebody who said the right thing, but they said it in the wrong way or at the wrong time? That's an example of what Paul's talking about. He's saying, listen, you can believe the right thing. Knowledge is good, but if you're not careful, knowledge leads to arrogance. Love is what's important. 
Love is more important than knowledge. Get the love right first. Then let's go with knowledge. And then we're going to see how it edifies the church. So that's about food that's sacrificed to idols. Then Paul gets into the issue at hand. Okay, so what do we do with this food? All right. So he wanted to establish that groundwork of, all right, love, more important than knowledge. Now how do we deal with food being sacrificed to idols? He says in verse 4, about eating food sacrificed to idols. So about eating it. Then we know that an idol is nothing in the world, right? So we see these quotes in these next couple of verses. These are probably quotes that Paul is receiving from them in his letter in, in his letter from them to him, okay? So he's quoting some of their words back to them, right? So about eating food sacrificed to idols, then we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God but one, right? So this is the knowledge that Paul is talking about. In context, he's saying there's, there's many of you who understand that I, these idols are false idols they're empty. They're not real. There's only one true God. You have this knowledge, and that's a right knowledge. Verse 5, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many, air quotes, gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father. So again, they live in this uh, they live in this culture that believes in all types of different gods. And Paul's point is saying this. Yes, they're, they're worshiping other gods, and it's idolatrous. And that in itself is an evil thing. However, we also cognitively understand that because this food was offered to an idol that was made by the hands of man and doesn't exist and is not real, like, it's empty. Like, it doesn't it just that doesn't matter that much, right? So we know that there's one true God. And then he continues in verse 6. All things are from him and we exist for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him and exist through him. And so what Paul is saying is he's affirming their belief. He is affirming this knowledge. Love is most important. But now that we're hitting knowledge, it's important that you understand, yes, there is one true God. These idols are false and fake. They're empty and void of anything real and powerful and meaningful. And to eat it, really, it, it's not accomplishing much. These idols are empty, the food that has been offered to them. But then what Paul says next in our passage is really, really important. And this is the key that we're going to drill down on. And it's going to help us to understand what we do with these gray areas in our faith, areas that we may not see eye to eye. Let's look at verse 7. He says, however, not everyone has this knowledge. Okay, so in other words, Paul is saying, listen, you're right in your belief, but there are some people that are just not there yet. You have people in your community who are still struggling with this issue. He's not saying you're wrong for saying these idols are fake and that they're false and I can just eat whatever I want to eat. But what he is saying is if we're leading with love before knowledge, this should stir something inside of us. Because you have brothers and sisters who have not yet come to this conclusion. And so he continues, some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Paul is saying, listen, for some people, old habits die hard. And some still struggle deeply with this area. They struggle deeply with this practice. Verse 8, food will not bring us close to God. Again, Paul is affirming what is being said, right? What you eat is not going to bring you closer or take you farther away from God. We are not worse off if we don't eat, and we are not better if we do eat. We just know that it, it doesn't make a difference in relation to you and your relationship with God as a follower of Jesus. This is what he's teaching them. But verse 9 is so important, and I think that this is what we need to grab onto as a church, and we need to live this, understand this, and live this out. Okay, listen to what he says. Verse 9, this is huge. 
But be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. Paul is saying, listen, you're right in your belief. But we're going to lead with love. We're going to consider our brothers and sisters who are maybe struggling or are still weak or are still kind of held up on some things, and we're going to honor them in that. So, he, so here's your big idea. Here's what I want to give you. This is what I think can help us, and we'll unpack just a little bit more. It's this. When dealing with the gray areas, in other words, the gray areas of our faith, consider the needs of your neighbor. When considering or when dealing with the gray areas of your faith, Consider your neighbor. This is what Paul said. This is why he started the conversation with, listen, man, get the love part, okay? Then let's work into the knowledge, and we'll go from there. So if you actually go to a, a couple of chapters later in the book, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul kind of revisits this theme. And listen to what he says in verse 23. You probably, you might have heard this before. Everything is permissible. Again, these are quotes. He's probably receiving these quotes from Corinthians. Everything is permissible. And then Paul responds, but not everything is beneficial, right? So I can do, because of my freedom in Christ, there's all kinds of things that I can do. And Paul says, that's true. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's beneficial for those around you. And then he continues with another quote. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. And then this is key, verse 24. No one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. So do you understand what Paul's saying? He's saying, yes, you're right in your beliefs, and you could do this, and you can walk in this way, but here, here's what's important to understand. You need to at least start by considering your neighbor before you go down that road, okay? Consider your neighbor. And so what we do is we have this temptation to operate as though we are looking out for the needs of ourselves and ourselves alone, that I start with my needs. But to be fundamentally a follower of Jesus is an others-first lifestyle. It's an others-first mindset. Jesus says, go and do unto others as I have done unto you. Love them the way I have loved you. And so this is what Paul is saying. And so if we jump back into our main passage, okay, we're going to, in the gray areas, we're going to at very least consider the needs of our neighbors. Let's go to verse 10, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 10. Paul continues, if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, in other words, the one who knows these are just fake idols, you're just eating meat, it's, there was no God that received honor or glory from this meat. So for anyone that has this knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? In other words, they used to struggle with this, man. Like, if they see you eating this food, they're going to struggle because they're going to go, well, this person's doing it. Like, maybe it's okay for me to get kind of dabble back in this and get back into this, right? This is what Paul's talking about. Verse 11, so the weak person... The brother or sister for whom Christ died is ruined by your knowledge. Paul is saying, you have got to consider your neighbor with the actions that you take, with the decisions that you make, with the movies that you watch, with the shows that you watch, with the music that you listen to, with the activities that you participate in, with the events that you find yourself attending, with the certain types of lifestyles that you find yourself affirming. Here's the thing. You can't call your brother or cause your brother or sister to stumble. Not necessarily because you're wrong, but because you're thinking about your own needs and preferences above theirs. That's what Paul's getting at. And so he says, he says this, and then let's get into verse 12. And this is powerful. He says, Now when you sin like this against brothers and sisters and wound their conscience, you are sinning against Christ. So here's what Paul is saying. He's saying if you knowingly engage in an activity that's going to cause your brother and sister in Christ to struggle or to lead them into sin, you are in sin. That's what he's saying. If you knowingly participate in something 
that's even nuanced or that's even, it's not black and white that people even disagree on. If you have a brother and sister in your life and in context, you're with them or you have influence with them and you knowingly lead them into an area that they struggle in and sin, you are in sin. That's, that's what Paul is talking about. And he, he's very clear in the words that he says. Now, when you sin like this against your brothers and your sisters, it's a sin. And then he says in verse 13 to, to wrap things up, Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. It's this very other's first mindset. And so what we can take from Paul today is we can take this idea that we should first lead with love, considering our neighbor before we consider ourselves. And then we can move into, is this okay? Is it all right? Okay, Because people will have mixed opinions. Um, it, it would, it would um, illustrate itself uh, this way. Here's kind of a, a goofy illustration, but... Um, back when Jess and I were dating, um, we, uh, I remember we were still kind of early in our relationship, um, and I think I've got a picture of us. Back whenever we were uh, dating early in our relationship, we would go to movies, you know. Yeah, I know, you're like, Joe looks so different. It's because I have a beard, right? That's why I look so different. But anyways, no, um, we, uh, we would go and like do fun stuff, obviously, what couples do. We get, I remember we went to a movie in particular. Now, I wanted to go to a certain movie, and this movie in particular is known for its brutality, okay? It's known to be kind of a gory movie. Some would say an unpleasant type of movie, all right? But I wanted to watch it. Now, I remember Jess was kind of uncomfortable to watch the movie. She didn't really want to um, because we were still kind of early in our dating relationship, and I didn't know her quite as well, as obviously, as I do now. But it's something that makes Jess really, really uncomfortable. And even though she was hesitant, I still kind of pushed us like, no, let's go to this movie. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Like, let's go to the movie. And so we, we do go to the movie. She gives in, right? And we're sitting in this movie, and I'm watching it, and I'm just like, this is the greatest thing ever. Look at this is just awesome. Look at how brutal this is, right? And then I look over to my right, and Jess has just has her eyes covered, and she's just staring at the floor, right? Jess just can't bring herself to look. It's, it, she's just struggling with it. She's having a hard time with it. Um, and then finally, it was just like, what have I done? Okay, okay, like, let's get out of here. Okay, so we ended up leaving the movie early because of the, like, the content of the movie. It was, just kind of, it was just kind of graphic stuff. Like, it was just gory stuff. And so after that, I felt terrible because I realized what I had done. I had pressured her into going to, to an, into a movie that she was not comfortable going into. And now I actually have learned since in our all these years of marriage now, if there was a Venn diagram of movies that we love, it would look something like this. I created a Venn diagram of things that we share in common, okay? Um, it's a very scientific process uh, that I went through, right? So movies Joe likes and movies Jess likes, you can see there's very, very little overlap, okay? Um, Jessica does not like to watch movies that are unpleasant, okay? That's just not her type of movie, okay? She likes romance. She likes some comedy. She likes some romantic comedies. And I'd say that's about it, okay? <laughs> right? And uh, so that there's a lot of genres that it kind of leaves out for me, okay? But, uh, but she likes these movies, and she's not wrong for that. That's not wrong for her to have that preference. But I will tell you this I've learned this as her husband, and this is going to sound kind of crazy to some of you, but because I've gone through this process of what Paul's talking about, it would be a sin for me to drag Jess into watching movies with me that made her really uncomfortable. It would be a sin for Joe Handy to say, Come on, it's not that big of a deal. Just watch the movie. Let's, let's, come on, like, just get past it. That would be a sin for me to lead my wife into a situation like that because I know the destruction um, or, or the damage that it does on her. She does not like it. It upsets her. And so that's kind of a gray area, isn't it? It's like, wow, Joe, you think it's a sin to watch a movie that has some violence or something in it? Well, for me, 
to bring, if I'm bringing my wife into that, yeah, it is. It's sinful. I shouldn't do that, right? And so that would be one example. So in light of that, um, how can we live this out? In light of Paul's teaching and in light of what Paul has taught us through this passage and through this situation with the, the uh, Corinthians, like, how should we go forward? What does this look like for us in 2023, okay? Here's a few things, a few questions that you can ask that are going to help you in this situation, all right? I got four questions to work through. First of all, should I participate in this activity? Should I watch this movie? Should I listen to this music? Whatever the scenario may be, should I fill in the blank as a follower of Jesus, okay? Here's some questions we need to ask ourselves. First, what does God's word say about it? What does God's word say about it? God's word is the most clear re revelation to us. We can know what God thinks about certain issues because he has spoken very clearly about it in his word. And so we can ask ourselves questions like, am I honoring God? Like, am I honoring him by participating in fill in the blank? Am I honoring him by exposing myself to fill in the blank? And so if, if we're dealing with an issue like, for instance, in movies, when I watch a movie, me personally, I can deal with violence. Um, I can deal with some language as long as it's not grotesque and it's not demeaning and just, just gut level inappropriate. But when it comes to sexuality and sexual immorality, um, naked people, yeah, that's my line. I, I can't do it. Because I know clearly in God's word, sexual immorality is a sin. That if I look upon a woman with lust in my heart, I've committed adultery with her. Right? There are just some things that are just clear in the scriptures. And, and so for, for some of us, th then you kind of get into, well, you know, where is the line with that? Like, some of it's kind of, it's not black and white. It's just kind of edgy. Maybe it pushes the edges a little bit. And, and, and here's what I would tell you. You have to resolve that yourself. You've got to figure that out. And that, that's what leads me to the next question is this. After prayer, these are questions we ask ourselves. After prayer, do I have a clear conscience about it? What does God's word say about it? And should I participate in this activity? After prayer, do I have a clear conscience about it? In other words, do I feel good about it? Like, are we cool? Like, do I feel good between me and God? And let me tell you, whether you're too permissive or whether you're too legalistic, okay, here's what I would tell you. You are at very least called to consider. You are at very least called to consider your conscience on these gray area matters. I'm not telling you you have to land on one side or on the other, but you are called to consider which side you land on, and do you have a clear conscience with God about it? There's a passage in Romans where Paul, again, he touches on this theme, and I think it's pretty helpful for us. Well, how do I know if I have a clear conscience about it, okay? Listen to what Paul says, okay? This is uh, Romans 14, starting at verse 19. I'm going to read it very quickly. So then, let us pursue what promotes peace and builds up one another. Are you seeing that theme? Verse 20. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Again, this is a similar context. He's talking about food and idols. Everything is clean, but it is wrong to make someone fall by what he eats. It is a good thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother, or it, it is a good thing not to eat meat drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, right, wherever you land on these issues, these gray area issues, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself for what he approves. And then here's the key, verse 23. How do I know if I have a clear conscience about something? Let this verse kind of guide you. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats. So in other words, Paul is saying, if you're not sure whether or not you should eat, maybe you shouldn't eat. He says, whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And everything that is not from faith is sin. 
So when it comes to these gray issues and we say, you know what, I, I don't know that I have a clear conscience. I don't know that I really feel good about this. I don't know that I'm right between God uh, and myself on this issue personally. Well, anything done from doubt leads to condemnation. And that means that if you're not doing it from faith, then it's probably sin for you. So let, let that passage kind of help you and kind of frame your understanding of, do I have a clear conscience about it? And then very quickly, we're going to move on. So what does God's word say about it? After prayer, do I have a clear conscience about it? The next one is this. Is this loving towards my neighbor? So consider your circumstances. Consider your surroundings. Do you have someone that might have a struggle and, and you're about to engage in an activity that would lead them to stumble, okay? So a very good example of this would be if I've got a friend who has, uh, uh, who has struggled with alcohol in the past, I'm not going to invite him to my house and, and try to be kind and hospitable by offering him a beer. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to cause him to stumble if that is an area that he struggles in. So that would be another example. Is this loving towards my neighbor? And then here's the last thing, and this is, um, hopefully this will be helpful for you, is even, even through this, if it's still unclear, if you're still not sure what to do, ask a mature believer that you respect. Talk with a mature believer that you respect. We have people that come to us and they ask us about particular issues because they're wrestling with it. And we want to be there to, to help you work through that. We want to help you um, know what you ought to do. So if it's unclear, ask a mature believer that you respect. So this is what we can do. What do I do with this great issue? How do I know whether or not I should participate in this or watch this or listen to this or um, affirm this or whatever? Wherever you land on this issue, this is what Paul says, man. Do you have your neighbor in mind? Does it come from a place of love? And so that's, that's all I have for us. But what I want us to do um, just very quickly is let's just be still right where we are. I want to encourage you just to bow your head and um, close your eyes. This always helps us just to not be distracted by the things that are going on around us. Um, I know that there are many of us that are in this room that maybe as I've been talking about some things, you've had stuff come to your mind. Um, I know as I was preparing this message, I had stuff that came to mind for me that I think maybe I was being a little too permissible on. And I've got a responsibility to act on that. Um, there are other areas, and, and there have been seasons in my life when I know I was too legalistic. My mind was made up. I knew this was the right thing. This is the way it's supposed to be. And I would judge my brother and sister in Christ because of it. And I did exactly what Paul said not to do. I led with knowledge, but knowledge without love. And it led to arrogance, and it was destructive. So regardless of where you fall, like on that spectrum, being too permissible or being too legalistic, you're at least called to consider where you fall on some of these issues. And so you need to ask yourself, am I too permissive? Do I just let too many things slide? Am I just, is my guard down? Am I am I being careless with the things that I consume? Or am I being too rigid to the point that I'm judging my brother and my sister? So right now, just between you and God, whether it's a specific issue or, or whether it's how you have dealt with your brothers and sisters in Christ on this issue. Let's just spend some time with God, just, just between you and God, if you're a follower of Christ, and work through those issues. Wrestle with that a little bit. That's your step. What is God showing you, and are you willing to act on it? And then here's the, uh, the last thing that I would want to share that's for the believers. Um, maybe there's 
those of us in the room that we would say, yeah, I, I don't necessarily know that I'm a Christian. Um, I, I would tell you this. Um, the, the most important step, the, the, the thing that you are called to consider above all things is whether or not you have a relationship with Christ. Whether or not you have submitted your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because what the gospel is and what the scriptures teach us is that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there's a free gift of God, and it's eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the good news is this. Though we have sinned against God, and we deserve to be separated from him forever, he made a way for us to be redeemed. He made a way for us to have our sins forgiven and be restored in relationship to God the Father. And it's through Jesus. And so what we do is we believe upon Jesus. We say, God, I believe Jesus is who you say he is. And I am believing upon not my goodness, but the goodness of Jesus and his sacrifice to save me from my sins. That's what we do. That's what it means to become a Christian. And so that's a really important step for you. And so what I want to do is I'm going to uh, again, if you're, if you're not a believer, just pray something like this just between you and God. God, I believe and confess that I've sinned against you. And God, there are areas in my life I cannot clean up on my own. I want to come to you for the forgiveness of my sins, God. I want to invite you to be the leader of my life, the Lord, my master. I'm going to follow you wherever you lead me. Please restore my relationship with you through Jesus. I'm trusting in you for the forgiveness of my sins. With every head bowed, eyes closed, if you prayed that with me, if you could, I'm not going to call you out or put you on the spot. I just want to know if you prayed that. If that's a decision that you made, if you could, just raise your hand and would say, yeah, I'm trusting Jesus for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but that that's something that you prayed. Just raise your hand. Cool. Um, what's going to happen is I'm going to pray for us. Um, some of us, we need to do work with the Lord. Um, we need to maybe repent of some things get some things right between us and God, um, maybe even get some things right between us and one of our brothers and sisters in Christ about the way we've carried ourselves or, or whatever that may be, but I'm going to pray. If, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, if you said, yeah, like I'm, I want to follow him as Lord, that's, that's something that I've really never just made a firm commitment on. As soon as we dismiss from announcements, um, come and talk to me. Just come and talk to me. And if you're like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to come talk to you because I'm too shy. Okay, that's fine. I, I totally understand. If you could, just on your purple card, just write your name. Make sure we've got a way to just reach out to you and just say, hey, I, I made a decision to follow Jesus today. And I promise we'll, we'll follow up with you. It won't be weird. I promise. Um, and so that's our step. So let me pray and then we'll continue. Father, we love you. Lord, we, uh, we thank you that you are a God who first loved us. And Lord, you give us um, boundaries and you, you give us um, uh, the, these uh, rules and, and things in our life to protect us. And a lot of times we don't see that. We think that they're just, um, that they exist just to restrict our fun or that you're, you know, you're just trying to be a, you know, a, a cosmic fuddy dud or something like that. But God, we know that you love us and you have good in mind for us. And so, Father, I pray where things are clear, we just follow you in the things that are clear, that are revealed in your word. God, for those of us that need to do the work to consider our conscience, for those of us that maybe we've participated in things, engaged in things, or whatever it may be, that we're just like, man, I failed you. I pray that we would confess that to you and the beautiful thing about you is you are always eager to forgive. You offer us the grace where we need it. 
And so, Lord, for those of us that are doing work, I pray that your spirit would be mighty in them and strong in them, that they would continue that work. And that, God, we would be a people that lead with love and then work our way into the knowledge and love each other well as brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we love you and we thank you for the example of Jesus in our life. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
right, y'all make some noise. Hey, you guys can have a seat. Uh, I took my headset off and then realized you're the announcement guy. So here I am with my handheld. Uh, hey, we're so glad that you guys made it today. Um, I know today was kind of challenging, but uh, I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit's going to work in us. He's going to do good work in us. Um, hey, just a few things that we want you to know about before you head out. Um, college students, we know some of you guys, this is going to be your last Sunday. We love you guys. Y'all be careful going back home. Um, we're going to miss y'all. It's going to be, we, we are, we're already looking forward to the day you come back, okay? Um, and so y'all have a great holidays. Um, for those of you, maybe you haven't filled out a purple card before. Um, right now is the time to grab that purple card and fill it out just to let us know who you are and who's coming through the doors of Progression Church. Um, maybe you've got a prayer request that you have, like you're not new to the church, but you're like, hey, I just need prayer about this. Um, we've had a chance to pray specifically for people from last week who gave us prayer requests. We want to pray for you this week as well. Um, and then, of course, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, again, I just want to encourage you, just write that on the card and then just leave that card on your chair and we'll follow up with you and we'll just kind of help you understand some of the next steps. And um, um, if you talk to us today, we have something that we can put in your hands, something to give you um, just to kind of help you uh, with that, uh, a new believer's bag. So um that's the card info just fill out your card leave it on your chair we'll swing by and pick it up um we're about to move into a time of giving and giving is just one of the ways that we express our generosity as believers uh, we believe that um, one of the ways to give back to god's kingdom is to give through the local church and so uh if you consider this your church uh, we just want to invite you just to give towards that um, and you can give multiple ways. You can give online. You can give through the QR code. You can give through text giving, um, through the Zelle app as well. You've got the info that you need to do one of those. And then, of course, you can give on location as well. Uh, we know this time of year is a year when you're like, when you want to kind of give gifts and everything before the end of the year. Um, and so this is just a friendly reminder. Hey, now's the time to do it if you want to do it. Um, and so you can also give on location. And so we just thank you guys for your generosity. We thank you. Um, you guys are an example of that. We see it in y'all um, all the time. And so we just want to encourage you in that as well. Um, groups are done, though, okay? Now, some groups might still be meeting. We are, we are officially done with groups. That means we're not sending out group questions and information to our group leaders. But if there are group leaders that still want to meet, talk to me, and we'll just make sure we're on the same page about schedules and stuff like that um, as we get ready to move through the winter break and into a new semester. And then also to our parents, we're going to go ahead and let you know that um, the Christmas Eve, uh, I believe, is Sunday. And so we're having a service then. And what we're going to do is we're going to have, like, uh, kids in the service. There will be no kids' church, but we're going to have activity bags for the kids that they can work on it while they're in the service. We just think it's kind of a good opportunity for families just to be together. We know it may not be the most convenient, but we do think it's important to be able to worship with our kids. Um, and so we want to invite you to, like, go ahead and bring your kids. Like, even if they're a disruption, it's okay. Like, they're kids, all right? Um, but we would love for you guys to have that opportunity to worship together as a family and be that example for your kids. And like I said, we'll try and provide some resources for you to make that um, go pretty smoothly. So I think that that's all we've got. If you're traveling, man, be careful. We love you guys. If you've got any questions for me or for Owen, uh, we are available. You guys are dismissed.